Human Tech, a podcast about the intersection between humans and technology. My name is Guthrie. I am here, Susan. Hey, Susan. Hello, Guthrie. And today um, we have a couple things to talk about. The first is uh, uh, sorry for the bit of a break between episodes, but you know, it, it happens. And uh, I am back from my very long trip. And that's that's part one. Part two is that uh, we have a fun new series uh, of podcast topics uh, coming your way. This is going to be, uh, this today is the first part of a broader series on design research. So we're going to have a number of episodes all about a different topic. Um, I, I know, uh, Susan, you have copious amounts of notes uh and uh diagrams and full flow charts and no i don't think you have those but you do <laughs> i do I have notes you though. do have notes yeah i have, have notes. scribble notes yes scribble notes um did you are they actually like the true scribble notes you want to you can show them <laughs> uh, it's scribble notes yes uh, i especially like when you do the um the uh it's sort of the the gra the what's it called the, the visual vi visual uh, vi visual mapping visual yeah mapping. i didn't do that with this um i probably will but very it's very uh um modern art esque with like scribbles and lines and yeah it's because everywhere. i'm really bad at it that's yeah. why it looks like that but yes yes <laughs> so i'll do that for you if that would make you happy i'll take a nice i'll get one of my I have, you know, artist pads with with yeah, large, large size and just, blank paper, and I draw yeah. a little. Well, we took that class on yes. you know, visual thinking, we and took a class on visual so thinking. Uh, I use that. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll hop right into it. So again, this is our our series on design research, and today's topic, the first the first topic that we are going to uh, talk about is collaboration. Yeah. So without any further ado, uh, Susan, <laughs> take, uh, it, take away, it away, Susan. Yeah. yeah away, so, um, you know, you, we, we do a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of consulting, a lot of mentoring on design research. And, and, um, one of the interesting ideas I've been thinking about and teaching about and collecting research on is collaboration because, you know, when we do, not only design research, pretty much any UX work at all, a, you know, a lot of the time we have to collaborate with other people. We collaborate with stakeholders and, and developers and other researchers. And I think collaborating with other people is one of those things that because we're social animals and we do it all the time, I don't think we stop and think about it enough. There's actually... You know, you know me, Guthrie, it's like all about human behavior and all about psychology. And there's actually science <laughs> behind how to collaborate effectively. And I think for the most part, we just ignore that. And it's like, oh, we need to do X, Y, Z. Well, let's get a meeting and let's, you know, so we put together a remote teams meeting with the three key stakeholders and the th two researchers and, and we just get together and, you know, maybe, maybe you, you have planned it out and maybe you are going to do some brainstorming and so on, but really, do you really know the research on how to collaborate more effectively? And, and do you have practical ways to bring that into the work that you're doing um, without having to, you know, necessarily do something drastically different. So that's what I wanted to cover. So, you know, we actually, as Guthrie, as you said, it's a series. So we're going to, we're going to do a couple of podcast episodes on um, collaboration. But this first one, I thought what we would do is just go through some of these considerations, these insights, the research. And then I'm thinking that in the, in the next one we do as part of the series, um, we'll get really uh, practical, and I'll share with you some perhaps different ways of collaborating that you might not have thought about before. So this is the kind of intro concept yeah. example uh, idea. And this is this is part of a larger body of knowledge that we have. Um, most of these, you know, we, we, we do, this is like a, a small little fun hour kind of, 
uh, chunk that has a lot of good stuff in it. But you know, we we can do it. You know, a, a week long workshop. Yeah, we on could go absolutely. And, yeah, yeah, we can. At Guthrie, we're famous for saying when people say, "Hey, can you do a, uh, you know, can you come do a session for our group on, you know, this topic?" and and what we always say is, sure, uh, we can do 10 minutes or five days. Like, what What do you want? <laughs> you know, or anything in between. Yeah. Uh, and that's yep. true of this topic as well. So so thinking about collaboration, there's pretty much um, it, it, three, three things I want people to think about uh, as we go into this, uh, especially if we talk about, you know, the, the research and, and what it is we know. So basically... There's a lot of research on um, the creative process, the problem-solving process about how humans think. Uh, wonderful research that that really shows what's really going on in there when you're trying to solve a problem or come up with new ideas. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because that research should change how you collaborate with other people if you want to do it in a way that fits the way your brain works. So I want to talk about that. Another thing I want to talk about is some of the science behind um, listening, because, you know, if you're collaborating, if you're doing research, you need to listen to other people. And there's actually uh, science around listening and how well we do or don't do it and how we can do it better. And then... The third one is uh, just about communication in general and some of the research on communication. So not just listening, but but just uh, communicating to other people effectively and what we pick up from other people. So those are kind of the three three high level things I wanted to talk about today. And uh, please stop me, Guthrie, if you have if you have questions about stuff. So um, if we start about uh, talking about creativity. And um, I, I go into great depth on, about this and other things. I mean, we even have, I think, a, an online course on creativity. But basically, hey, Guthrie, here's a question for you. Do you know how your brain works to when you're being creative <laughs> or when you're solving problems? Um, uh, or right. maybe... Your brain is not like everybody else's. No, it, it's uh, I have I have a I have a cursory understanding. All right, so I, only because only because I've watched you teach this subject. Before. <laughs> okay, you've heard this before. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, of course. But, I've heard yeah, this. I should I should put you on the spot and see what you remember. But basically, I won't do that. Basically, there are three salience networks. Oh, he remembered one of yeah, them, Salience yeah. Network. You remember the other two? No, I know. You, you, you go ahead and do it. Yeah. All right. So there are three brain networks that have to do with creativity. And, you know, I think sometimes we like to think, oh, I'm being creative and I'm being creative in my own way. And my way of being creative is different than anyone else's. But, you know, sorry, not true. We're human. So there's three brain networks. One is the Salience Network. One is the, um, I didn't name these. The Imagination Network, which I always think sounds like a ride at Disney World. Let's go on the Imagination Network. And then the third one is the Executive Attention Network. Actually, I just gave them to you in reverse order. So let's just talk about this. So essentially what happens when you're being creative, the first part of it is your Executive Attention Network. I'm pointing to my forehead because that's literally where it is. So the first part of, of if you want to be creative effectively, you have to give your brain the question, the the thing you're trying to be creative about, the problem you're trying to solve. You have to consciously pinpoint and focus on what it is you're working on and be able to state that succinctly. And that's really important. And that's why, you know, I think it's so interesting when you're collaborating, it's so important that you state, okay, guys, we're going to get together and here's the problem we're going to solve, or here's what we want to think about, or here's, and whether you're doing this alone or you're doing it with others, um, you know, if you're collaborating, you're doing it with others, you want to make it very clear. We Here is what we are working on. And the reason that's so important is because that's what engages your brain. 
and gets it going on being creative and on solving the problem. And then the next thing that happens is that focus goes to the uh, imagination network. And the imagination network is, is a broad name for a huge amount of unconscious mental processing that your brain does to try and solve that problem or come up with some creative ideas. And so basically what happens during when the, when this idea is floating around in your imagination network is you are running simulations based on, uh, uh, all your experience. And interesting with collaborating, it means that your brain is running, is trying to solve the problem based on your experience and knowledge. And, but we're working together. So my brain is trying to solve the problem based on my experience and knowledge. And this is why collaborating is so powerful because we have like five people in the room with not exactly the same amount of experience and knowledge, but all of our brains are combing through and running simulations to answer the problem. So that's really, uh, you know, that's like the power of collaboration. And then what happens is once that's all running through your, your brain and you're running these simulations unconsciously, you don't even realize you're doing it, then certain ideas get brought to your consciousness. That's the salience network. The salience network is kind of always monitoring what's going on in the imagination network. And it actually decides, Ooh, that one, that's a good idea. That would solve the problem or, Oh, that's a good new creative thing we could do. And it take grabs that idea and brings it up to consciousness. And those are those aha moments that you have. And that's how our brains work. That is just the way our brains work when we're being creative or we're solving problems. So if you think about it, there's things you can do when you're collaborating with others to help that process along. And so one of those, for instance, is um, you want to set the intention in the executive network, uh, executive attention network. You want to set the intention, what problem are we solving, what ideas are we looking for. But then you have to let the, if you're going to let the unconscious work, you have to have, you have to let it work. You have to have time. So one of the mistakes we make when we collaborate is we bring everybody into the meeting and we say, okay, here's what we're going to work on today. Uh, we're going to see if we can come up with ideas for, you know, X, Y, Z. And then immediately everyone's supposed to come up with the ideas, but we haven't given the imagination network any time to run simulations. So that's a big mistake. So here's a very simple, practical thing you should do when you're collaborating. You should get your group together and tell them what the focus of the collaboration is going to be. Make sure everyone's clear on that. And then you end that meeting. It's like a 15 minute meeting. And then you'll come back in a couple hours, a couple days, two weeks. I wouldn't do more than a couple of weeks because then they'll forget. But you come back to do the actual collaboration brainstorming part of what you're going to do. You got to have that time. So that's an example of a thing that you can do to really work with the, the, the creativity and the way your brain works. And Guthrie, as we go, as we continue on through the series, I, I want to come back to this and talk about some other, other practical ideas that you can do that will help you be, you know, really work with that process. But, um, that's kind of an overview of, of one piece of this. So if you want to collaborate better, then you need to work the way the brain works. All right. You, you got any questions on that one, Guthrie? Um, no. no. Okay. It's, uh, you, you, if, if you have, um, no, no, this is, this is the, this is the, uh, the high level, the high level over the high stuff. level look at everything. Yeah. Right. No question. Okay. So, um, and if we have time, I don't know how long it's going to take me to do the, this high level. If we have time, I might come back and give some more pointers on some of these. But so that I don't run out of time, I want to move forward and talk about um, the research on listening. So, um, you know, when you're collaborating or even just when you're doing design research and you're interviewing people, a lot of what we need to do is listen 
to other people. And uh, I think people who do design research and people who do a lot of collaboration probably think that they're pretty good listeners. Um, and maybe they are. But there was some interesting research that was done um, by someone named Spitzberg in 1994. Were they in Pittsburgh? No, Spitzberg, not Pittsburgh. Spit, no, no, Spitzberg from Pittsburgh. That would be funny. I don't know if they're from Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, uh, and the, they wrote this chapter in a book, and the chapter's called The Dark Side of Interpersonal Communication. What a strange what title a for a chapter. And, and the book is called The Dark Side of Incompetence. I like I like these people. This is a really optimistic. You know how I tend to be like all dark and pessimistic. These yeah, people yeah. are in my, on my team. Yeah. Uh, anyway, here's some research they did. That I thought was fun. So they studied eight thousand people, people who worked in businesses and hospitals, universities, military, government agencies. Everyone was in the U.S., I'll say that, but they all these people were doing all this different kind of work and, um, you know, interviewed them and gave them a survey. And uh, they all, most people said uh, that they believed that listening and communicating effectively is important. And they all said that they are a better listener than everyone else. So this is this is super common, right? U.S. people, you know, are you a better driver than everyone else? Are you, <laughs> right. you know, a, a better X or Y? People always say, I'm not the best, but I'm probably better than, I'm better than that person. Yeah. So, so that's, basically, that's you know, everybody's above average, <laughs> yeah. which is like... Yeah. Not statistically I'm possible. A speller than everybody than thinks American. they are a better listener than most other people, um, and and so that was one thing they found out. And then they also found out that uh, most people said that listening effectively is a very important skill for their work, and most people felt that they didn't have to improve their own skill in it. <laughs> so yeah. basically. Yep. We think we're great listeners. We think it's important. We don't think we need to work on it. And um, then the real data, the real data is, and this is from uh, different researchers, um, uh, but the real data is that the average person listens at about 25% efficiency. So we're actually really bad at listening. And and I'm I'm willing to bet that the people, Kathy, who are listening to this podcast, and hopefully they're listening, but I bet they think that they're well. I'm much better than twenty. I've listened at more than twenty five percent. What's fascinating is podcasts as a concept, because the whole point of podcasts is they are designed for people to listen casually. Yes, not always, but like. You know, you can be doing the dishes. Or right. So you, you're listening, around. kind of. Kind, You can kind of pop in and out. But there's no stakes because there's no quiz. It's not like it's a personal friend. It's, right, it's not like right, a business right. thing that it's you It's not like do. I'm going to ask you afterwards, do you remember? Like they are designed thing? to be low stakes and you can just sort of. So this is kind of, yeah. Out. So Guthrie, should I just assume meta. that nobody's really, that people are only going to retain 25% of. What Wait now, about? okay now, okay. I do actually have a question. What is what does that mean to to listen? Because you just mentioned the word retain. Yeah, so is listening retaining information, or is listening comprehension, or what? what yeah, yeah. In the research, it's a combination of comprehension and retention. Okay, so listening, being a quote good listener unquote, just means that you comprehend what you're being told. Because probably you're paying attention, and then you retain that information. Yes, again, probably because you're paying. Because you're paying attention, right? Okay. So here, okay, so so 
we're really bad at it. We think we're pretty good at it. We don't think we have to get better at it. I also want to mention, um, well, here, I'm going to give you a quiz, Guthrie. Here's a, here's a quiz question. So if you, th- you th- I want you to think about these three groups of people, right? Group number one is children who are in the first and second grade, so around the ages six, seven, eight, okay? Next is youngsters who are in, in junior high, so they're like uh, uh, 13, 14 years old. And then the other group is um, uh, recent high school graduates, okay? So we have the three groups. Uh, which group is our better listeners if we're talking about information retained and comprehended? Oh, no, I, I remember I remember all this, so okay. I, I'm, I'm cheating. Oh, okay. Well, you remembered, so you listened. So, what did you remember? Uh, what what were the categories again? We have we, let's just say we have seven year olds, thirteen yeah. year olds, yeah. and recent high school graduates. It goes. You one would expect that it's that the high school graduates do the best, but actually it is inversed, and kids do the best, and then and it just gets worse over time. Right. So ninety percent for seven year olds. <laughs> So I, I I am I'm good at I'm good at remembering useless bits of information. Good, so good. Like I'm good at yeah, very team. good. So very good. look, uh, the audience should know I haven't you know I haven't heard this in like years, but I yeah. I, I do. I you do retain the information. Yeah. You listened well. Ninety yeah. percent of seventh graders, forty four percent of thirteen year olds, and twenty five percent of the high school graduates, which is what what it is for adults. So yeah. So that's that's kind of interesting too. All right. So basically, we're not that great at listening. And we have to be careful because we're going to think that we're special and we're better listeners than everyone else. And we may or may not be. And the problem is that when you listen, you, you, um, you know, you, you kind of, you're, you're affected by your own cognitive biases you tend to pay attention more to things you agree with. Um, it's really easy to just start uh, putting your own ideas on top of what they're saying. And, um, you know, even if you're trying to pay attention, it doesn't mean that you're really getting the information clearly. And if you're doing design, you know, design research, if you're trying to, you know, listen to other people, or if you're collaborating with your stakeholders, you really, you know, if you're not really listening, that's, that's a problem. Basically, you're just feeding back to yourself what you already believed. And that's not great. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that one of the techniques to use to, uh, not fall into listening traps and to make sure that you're paying attention is to do what's called active listening or some in the literature it's called effective listening and it's kind of boring and nobody wants to do it (laughs) you know it's like a lot of work so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to um uh you know set an intention to listen I have to say ahead of time, I'm really going to listen to this person. I'm going to suspend my judgment and my, you know, uh, because as soon as people start talking, you start, you know, like, well, I don't know if that's true, right? Uh, So suspending that kind of judgmental part and just listen. Um, Give someone your undivided attention. We are so bad at that, especially lately, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I I have a uh, I have a friend who is in the um, uh, the stand up comedy slash sort of improv scene. Yeah, and uh, they have said that ever since the pandemic, yeah, uh, the crowds just haven't you know uh, haven't really been into it. Uh, stand up comedy or improv requires so much that everyone in the room is bought in. 
that they're there, so that they're hanging on every word, right, right. that they're giving the person up on stage all of their attention. And then it yeah. builds, right? Because if, right. you know, some of the room is like really locked in and thinks it's hilarious, the rest of the room kind of grabs it. And you know, as you're a speaker, right? When the whole room is paying attention to you and you just have it's them in really the, different, the palm right? their hand. And uh, they said that since the pandemic, it, the crowds just haven't been the same. They there's been a there's they've been distant there's been sort of a disconnect wow uh, they they haven't you know like they they just can't they can't you know, they don't, get their they don't have their undivided attention they don't and they're have not their suspending undivided attention. Judgment. you know and they're like you know because the crowds are kind of there and they're listening to the jokes and they'll kind of there's like chuckling right they're kind of ha 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 and then it just kind of you know kind of kind of fades out right um and then they'll you know i don't know looking around the room or checking their phone or yeah you know, yeah 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 um, or, or they're, or they're, they're, they're staring, they're looking, but they're not like, they're not really paying attention. They're not, well, it's not even paying attention. It's like hanging on every little nuance. And that's, 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 that's the difference between, you know, a hot room and a, and a dead room. Um, well, I remember you and I went to an improv theater. I still remember that. I, I think it was, it's, it ranks up there as either the top or the second i or maybe it's tied for because there's this one was a lot of years ago it was well not that many years ago what so eight, 10 years ago eight years ago we went to an improv theater thing in in chicago and you know it was like i don't know an hour and a half long without a break uh two guys and it was one, it wasn't the kind of improv theater thing where they, you know, oh, someone give me a situation. You know, it wasn't that. They they, did, they didn't even tell you what the situation was. It just unfolded in front of you. And there was nothing on, I think they moved around the stage and they had like chairs, two folding chairs. Otherwise, there was nothing else on the stage. You know, they pretended to use props, but you had to use your imagination. And they unfolded in improv style this entire story and multiple relationships, and it was really complicated. <laughs> and uh, I, and you had uh, they were masterful, and you got the whole room was so invested in it, and and but you had to be really paying attention, and you had to use your imagination, you had to suspend judgment. Um, so I understand, you know, and this was pre-pandemic. Um, I wonder if they're struggling with this post-pandemic in the same way. They were so they were so good, and it was such an immersive experience because of it, because you were creating it in your brain while it was happening. Um, but it does require that did require a deep amount of listening yeah. for sure. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Other things, uh, about effective listening. So we said, set your intention to intention to listen, suspend judgment, give your undivided attention, wait to ask questions. I think this is something, again, I don't know that we're always good at that. Uh, when we're collaborating with other people, when we're doing design research, there's, I think there's a tendency to jump in and ask a follow-up question. And of course you're going to want to ask questions, but you really need to, if you're listening, you need to wait. And then that the last one that I think people find really annoying is reflecting back what you have heard. Okay. Um, so I, I think, but it's really important. It's important for two reasons. One is because you might have heard it wrong and you need to find out. Uh, and also because when you reflect back to the person what you heard them say, what you think you heard them say, then they know you were really listening. So there's that sense of, okay, this person is really is listening to me. So this act of listening, it's not our normal listening style. And you will probably run into active listening in uh, there's other places that you would run into it, like what? Um, so, for example, uh, uh, a lot of a couples therapy, you know, yeah. pers personal relationships, uh, 
you, besides the business world where, where we're obviously that's where sort of we're talking about it. Uh, yeah. It's very, very common there, but it is, it is sort of a technique that's more, more applicable and broad. Yeah. 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 Areas. Definitely. in any kind of therapy. Yep. Teachers. Uh, maybe with like kid with like young, young children. Maybe, maybe, but I don't know. Maybe. So the more you practice these, you know, active listening techniques, the better you get at it. You have to practice it. It's got to be a conscious, purposeful thing. And and I don't know that it ever becomes, quote, you know, the nat- your natural mode to do active listening. I, I, I think it's always, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm doing active listening right now. I think you have to, like, kick into kick into it because I think it really isn't the normal way that we listen. All right. So that was, so we talked about creativity and we talked about listening and how bad we are at it. So the third thing I wanted to kind of cover is just some stuff about human communication in general. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm just thinking here about about where to start. So uh a lot of human communication is automatic and unconscious. And and you know, you start talking and I'm reacting to what you're saying and I'm listening in a certain way or maybe not listening, and I'm just not even aware of how I'm processing the information. So I think we just have to understand that that it's it's hard. It's hard to to uh, listen, it's hard to talk, it's hard to get our ideas across. Uh we're probably going to be misunderstood or not listened to. I just think um when you know, I think collaborating with others is critical, but I think we've all got to understand that it is imperfect. And I think some of the um, techniques that we that we can use, and I'm going to talk about uh, some of them here in our session today, and then in when we do another session on collaboration, I'll I'll talk some more about it as well. But um, the different techniques that you can use when you're collaborating uh, help overcome some of these biases and imperfectness. So that's that's what you, I guess if I had to say anything, that's what I would say. I would have to say because we're human and and we don't communicate always perfectly, um, that's why we need techniques to help us, to help us overcome some of the imperfection. But let's talk about some of the human communication stuff. Um, We communicate a lot with more than just words. And and you're going to, you know, like, well, of course we do. But I just don't think we realize how important other things are, like, you know, our facial and expressions when we're talking. Uh, There's a whole thing called paralinguistics that I think is just such an interesting area of research. So for instance, Guthrie, I can say to you, you know, even if you can't see my face, okay, I can say, that sounds like a great idea. Or I can say, that sounds like a great idea. Or I can say, that sounds like a great idea, right? And I, I just said it three different ways and conveyed three different messages, but the words were exactly the same. And so the way I said them, the tone, whether I went up, whether I went down, what I emphasized, that that's called paralinguistics. And, you know, like, we know this, but do we ever really stop and think about the way that we're saying something and how much we can communicate? And, uh, you know, I love it when people say something like, 
that's a great idea. And then the other person is like, well, okay, if you don't want to do it. And it's like, I said it was a great idea. It was like, yes, yeah, sure you did. But the way you said it was a great idea conveyed that you did not think it was a great idea. You're right. So, so that's the paralinguistics at work. So that's, you know, we, we got to, as I said, our, our gestures, our facial expressions, our body language, um, are all communicating, which brings me to then a conversation we have to have. If we're going to talk about collaboration, we got to talk about collaborating in person versus collaborating remotely on teams or on zoom or everything else. Um, I was talking with someone yesterday uh, who is a, a researcher and we were talking about the fact that, you know, before the pandemic, we did a lot of research in person. We would get together with people. We would go to their work site and observe them working or interview them in their, in the medical clinic or, you know, at the construction site. And, then of course the pandemic came and nobody, you know, we started doing everything remote. Well, now, you know, we're going back out there, but the research is not going back out there. Uh, and I would have to say with the clients we're working with, they've not gone back to in-person research. For the most part, we're all staying uh, on Teams and Zoom. And there's, you know, it's cheaper, it's cheaper, it's easier, it's more efficient. Yeah. Do you, do you want to go flying around the country or flying around the world? I mean, you know, we can, we can interview 20 people in the course of two weeks, or if we do it online, or we can take two months and go run around to all the locations. I, so it's, it's less time consuming. I get it. I do. And I, I'm doing it too. But the amount of information you're missing is huge. And if you're talking about collaboration, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You know, you can, you can get together with your stakeholders or your other researchers or your other designers and collaborate on something together. And you can do it in person or you can do it in a, on a mural board or a mural board in the teams meeting, but you have to understand it is not the same thing because you're missing, you get the paralinguistics, but you're missing a lot of other things. And I know even with video, you can say, well, you have video, you can see their facial expressions. Well, kind of, but you can't see their body language. And I don't think people are the same in facial expressions on video. And let's go back to our listening thing. I mean, we talked about, you know, the 25%. That that didn't count on a Teams meeting. So, Guthrie, you want to tell me in a typical Teams meeting that has five people. Or Zoom. Or Zoom that goes on for an hour with five people, what is the likelihood that all five people are really, are not, what is the likelihood that the five people are not checking their email, checking their chat, looking at their phone, working on something else? I think, I think everyone knows the, the answer to this. Yeah. It's like. It goes without saying. It's so. Really- you don't have full engagement. You've got people doing multitasking and task switching. But am I talking, is this just like. Which, uh, and so here's what I'll say. I, what? That's not necessarily a, a, a terrible crime because so often uh, if you're in the office and let's just say you missed a meeting and you're all there in person, you can do the stop by someone's desk on your way to, you know, five minutes before the next meeting, hey, what'd you guys talk about in so and so and such and such? And you can get caught up. But when you're all remote, then there's no way to catch up. I guess you could send a message or whatever, but 
for the most part, people get over invited to too many meetings. There are too many people yeah. on the call. And so if, if there's too many people on the call, like if we're just talking about efficiency, like you should be in the time, in the many, many minutes, you know, that 85% of the meeting when you are not needed, if the meeting is not about you or your direct team, you know, it maybe makes sense for people to be working on other stuff because they're, they shouldn't be there. But there's certainly, uh, uh, it's certainly different than if everyone is just in the room at the same time. So is it, um, does it really not matter because we're never going to go back to doing things in person? Oh, I don't want to say never say never, but, um, some things that are expensive in the business sphere have faded away and maybe they were a mistake, but they were too expensive and we just, we're not, you know, for, for the moment, we're not going back. I'll give you two examples. We'll, we'll see if I can think of a third one. Example number one is uh, administrative assistance. So back in the 40s and the 50s, especially if you looked at management, the number of people, assistants that they had was enormous. There's a, well, uh, I would say even more recent than that. Well, fine. The 60s, the 70s. 70s, yeah. end of the 80s. Um, it kind of died out slowly over time. But yeah, you'd have tons of secretaries and people who sat in every meeting just to take notes for everyone. And what a great idea. You know, right? Like, like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the people who I'd were in the meeting could this, yeah. focus on just oh, being brilliant and creative yeah. and doing the things that they could do, freeing up those resources to be very productive. And then you you delegate some of the things that could be delegated to office assistants and so on but they were they were expensive and so over time there were these called computers and then you could you didn't need uh, a secretary to type up a memo or to you know create a note you just send off an email yourself and uh it was cheaper to do it that way so that went away so that's like the first thing and the second thing is uh uh like travel stipends like back at, back back in the day, if you were traveling for work, there would be all these you know benefits, and you got a lot of money, and you get you get paid for your travel time and all sorts of yeah. Remember that concept? That's that, that's all gone. That, that's time? too expensive. So we're just gonna. So there are some things that are expensive that just go away in the yeah. workplace. Um, there are some things that kind of pendulum back and forth. You know where. You know, eh, you know, we we did it this way, and then we decided, oh, like the open concept stuff, where it's like, oh, everything's got to be open concept, and the people are like, actually, we don't like this, so now it's kind of like back to quasi open concept stuff. So I could see it either way. I could see it one on one hand, it's a pendulum, and yeah, we did a bunch of remote stuff, and then companies are like, actually, there are benefits to being in person, and it kind of swings back the other way. I could also see it just going away, where companies are like, wait a second, you know, it's really expensive having a desk for every single employee, why are we paying for office space when we could just have our employees pay for office space in their own homes? And we've just offloaded that expense. Something that as a company we've been doing for almost a decade now, yeah, uh, 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 milking our employees' uh, uh, <laughs> homes as, as, an, as a substitute for, for, for spending copious amounts of office space. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Susan used to have an office. A I big, did. I a had big, an huge, enormous, a big, 20, enormous office something. building I owned, and yeah. I had uh, yeah. uh, the break room and the lobby area yeah. and yeah. Uh, and like, offices wait, and cubicles. And no one works where I am. Why? Why do I? Why am I paying well, for this? Okay, I did have it for a while because we would do our training sessions training there. there. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. But, so, I know. So, so we, you know, something that we've been doing this for, we were sort we of ahead of the curve. We did get rid of the office. We yeah, ahead of the, the curve office. there to keep our costs down. And a lot of big companies are like, wait, why do we have 50 million square feet of expensive retail space that well, we're paying and, for? Well, and if, when if no any, one's coming into the office, like I know, no. I, I even, I mean, you know, you and I, when we go visit offices these days and go, we are doing more in-person workshops and all of that, which we love. Uh, but we have noticed that even places where, you know, the workers have been, quote, called back, they're typically not 
necessarily called back five days a week. And I mean, there's just huge, huge swaths of office space and chairs and desks that are barely used. So I, I walk around and wonder why, why is it, why are they paying for all this? But, um, yeah, yeah I want to go back though to one thing town-ish. you, ghost townish. Yeah. I want to go back to one thing you said though, cause when you were talking about, Oh, you used to have an administrative assistant who would come in and take notes. And I want to talk about that in terms of, um, you know, doing research and ha- doing collaborative work because, um, it actually, it actually uh, is a good idea to have now. I, so I don't call it note takers because uh, I think that doesn't really um, convey what the person's really doing. And I tend to call it a scribe. Uh, not I, not not a scribe. Not like I'm ascribing something to this feature. Scribe. A, A space space, scribe, S-C-R-I-B-E. So when you are, uh, when you're doing interviewing, and any of you guys listening who are researchers and do interviews with people, um, you know how tricky it is to listen to the person and take notes about what they're saying and you also have to be thinking of what is the next, you know, oh, based on that, what do I want to do next? Do I want to go on to the next question or do I have another probing? You know, do I need to ask them a question about what they just said? So, so you're trying to listen, you're trying to think about what to do next, you're trying to facilitate, and then you're supposed to be good at taking notes. And that that's hard to do. Also, also when you're collaborating together with a group of people, and you have, you know, people are supposed to be coming up with ideas about this. So they're they're doing the creative thinking process. And at the same time, you know, some they're they're supposed to capture, you know, what's going on. So I think it is actually very useful to have a scribe. Now, here I know what's gonna happen next. People are gonna say, well, that's why we video the session. That's why we have video. But, you know, if you video the session, somebody has to go watch it later and scribe from that. So you're still going to need a scribe. So I think the role of scribe is underrated. I think it's really important. I think it's very useful. I think it frees up everybody else to concentrate on the collaboration or the interview at hand. Um, So I... I'm a big fan of of having someone scribe. The other reason, by the way, that a live scribe can be so useful is you can see the summary of what the group is doing unfold in front of you. That moves the group forward. It allows for more ideas. So I'm going to recommend... Uh, based on you know this whole idea of how people communicate and how we work together, that you consider having a scribe, the role of scribe in your collaboration sessions. Um, it is likely that you know maybe again if there's like an AI whatever in in a year maybe m- maybe they'll be able to just take good notes in the way that a good a good scribe currently can. Did I just hear you say something positive about AI? Because you t- usually are very pessimistic about AI. I, it's not positive. It's just just a reality. <laughs> you still won't admit it. Uh, no, there there are certainly potential benefits of AI employing large segments of the population, uh, like scribes. So yeah. there you go. If that's positive to you. Then okay. uh, sure. <laughs> then you, then you'll let it go. Into the <laughs> sure, yeah. I guess, I guess that's You'll reluctantly you just, let it go. You just made on. an ancient profession obsolete. Congratulations. It's progress. What scribing? Yes, it's literally called a scribe. It's like an ancient Egyptian word or whatever. <laughs> Some Roman. Hey, yeah, I, you know, if, if Indo-European. Uh, I am not convinced that AI could 
do the job of scribe, but I I'm willing to. Yeah, I'm definitely convinced. Try I think it. Do a much better job. Really? Um, it would know yeah. what to look for. It would know what what just got said that was really significant to the purpose at hand, and what just got said that could be ignored. I think so. Ooh. I think so. All right. Well, I would. I'd like to uh, try that. Teams out. is already rolling out a bad version of it, so I think it could <laughs> probably get to good. Yeah. Well. And again, it's all about you know the the cost the cost feature is very important. Hmm. Um, so, but yes, yeah. So it's possible these problems will solve themselves. That's uh, that's interesting. Uh, just just as a. As a, because you brought it up very quickly, it, I am less concerned with AI being a scribe in this case because they're not pretending to be another human being. It is mm. a tool that mm. the people in the room are leveraging to do a function. And so in that capacity, it, it's sort of that's sort of like the better version of it. Interesting. In, in that it is simply, it, it is dictating a conversation and then pulling out uh, the relevant tidbits and it, that's, and that's all it's doing as opposed to being a participant, as opposed to pretending to be something that it's not, or to do, do the work. It's not doing yeah. any of the work. So it's a little lower on my, on my list of evil AI tasks. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. All right. In the t in the time that we have left, there's something I would like to d do. If this is all right with you, I'd like to just give some examples of maybe some different collaboration techniques you might want to try um, that are related to the. We just talked about creativity, talked about listening, we talked about humans communicating, and I thought um, maybe I could just share some collaboration techniques that might that fit into one or more of those and and might be a little different than what people are doing and might be useful is that all right with you uh sure you do whatever you want it's your session <laughs> <laughs> i love this idea yeah. Yeah, okay all right so i there i have a lot of different techniques so it's a little hard for me to pick you know, what should I talk about? What's one of my favorite ones? Um, and I'm struggling to tell you the truth between picking something, sharing something that's simple versus sharing something that's a little more complicated. Do you have a suggestion on which way I go? Uh, or I could do one simple, one complicated, maybe? Well, I... Uh, are we going to continue this in a in session two? Yes. So let's so don't get too far afield then because we don't have a ton of time here. Okay. So let's keep All it right. simple. Let's keep it simple. All right. So in that case, uh, let me talk about a technique. Oh, by the way, can I make a plug for a book that's not my book? Sure, always. All right. I'm going to hold it up here. Um, if you guys don't have this book called Game Storming by Dave Gray, Sonny Brown, and James McAnufo, I think. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Um, I highly recommend this book and some of the techniques that I'm going to talk about uh, right now and next time uh, are from this book. And you can even see, Guthrie, can you see, for those of you who are watching and not just listening, see my little <laughs> pieces of paper where I marked particular pages that, that I wanted to go back to. Uh, it's a great book, and it's really all about um, different collaboration techniques. And and what I did was I went through some of these and, you know, tied these, some of them into these principles that, and the research that we've been talking about, because I think some of them really, really help with that. So, um, and this one, Guthrie, this one relates to something you and I were talking about yesterday afternoon. 
so I'm going to share, uh, I want to talk about, and this is one of those things where I really should show it so you're going to have to use your imagination because uh, we're talking uh, and many of you are listening in an audio format and not looking. So one thing that is um, interesting and useful to do when you're doing a collaborative session with other people is to lay out the time, you know, like there's, you know, we're going to do three activities today or, you know, so the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to, you know, we're going to review what we're trying to collaborate on and solve. And we'll take a few minutes to do that. And then next we're going to do a brainstorming thing. We'll take a few minutes to do that. After that, we'll consolidate the information, right? You have like this agenda of what you're going to do with your time. Maybe you have an hour, maybe you have two hours. And, um, it's, it's always a good idea to lay that out so that people know what to expect. So when we're dealing with humans, um, we want to give them that structure that will make them feel comfortable, that they know what's happening and they know what's coming next. It makes them feel like somebody is somewhat in control and then they can relax and just participate. Um, but we tend to do that in a linear way. We tend to do that, you know, we have, uh, you know, words on a page or on the mirror board and, you know, we say, uh, 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 reiterate intention, you know, we're going to take five minutes for that. And then on the next bullet line, you know, brainstorming on blah, 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 we're going to take 30 minutes for that, right? We do it very linear, linearly. But we actually know that people kind of think of time not necessarily linearly. And so one technique that um, Dave Gray talks about in his book is doing a pie chart of time. So take a circle and divide it up visually into slices of the pie that correspond to to the amount of time you're going to take. So if you're going to take a few minutes to introduce the, the, the session, then you'd have a small slice of the pie starting at noon and going to about, you know, one o'clock and you can write in there, you know, intro. And then if you're going to do maybe a 30 minute brainstorming, right, you're going to have a big slice of pie and you can write in brainstorming there. And that would be like from one o'clock to five o'clock, right? So you, you draw your agenda in a circle, in a pie chart, and it helps convey what percentage is happening when. It's just a visual way. This is like one of the simplest things I can explain here, the visual way of showing how you plan to use the time. And I'm, and Guthrie, this is when you, we were talking yesterday about this other, um, what's the, what's the name, the time timer or something that the, you don't have yes. it. You, yes. you purchased it, it but it hasn't timer. arrived yet, right? Yes. It's and time it's timer. yeah, time timer. So um, it's a little device you can purchase, uh, or a big device, or a big device. You can get it yeah, in a little one, or you can get sizes. a big one. And it's a it's a circle, uh, which shows the um, passage of time with a, a big a big color area changing. Um, not it's not digital, right? This is a mechanical analog yep. device, and yep, not uh, digital. and it seems to really help people visualize how much time is left, how much time has been spent. Uh, so there seems to be something about this visual and circle way of representing time that is useful. So I think if you're collaborating with others, uh, that would be a good thing to do. So. That's just a simple idea. And Guthrie, that simple idea took me so much longer <laughs> to explain uh, than I thought it was going to. So th- I'm probably going to leave it at there, leave it at that. And it's just then we can say that at our next session, we are going to dive deeper into various techniques that use these s- principles of research that, that we talked about. Does that sound okay with you? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll, we will see you back at the next session. And that will be all about collaboration techniques. Collaboration techniques. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.